Welcome to Business Insight. I'm Peter Marks. My guest is Raj Sisodia. He's a professor at Babson College and author of the new book, Conscious Capitalism. Raj, pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Peter. Nice to be here. What prompted you to write the book? Well, it's really uh, uh, part of a journey that I've been on for the last uh, eight or nine years. Uh, I've been a marketing professor for, this is my 30th year of mm -hmm. teaching, actually. And over time, I became increasingly frustrated mm -hmm. with the discipline and, and the function uh, of marketing. And did a lot of research looking at the efficiency and effectiveness of marketing. Mm -hmm. And documented the fact that over time, we were actually spending huge amounts of money mm -hmm. and increasing amounts of money uh, collectively mm -hmm. as, as a society on marketing. And yet, if you look at the outcomes of that, the customer loyalty, customer trust mm -hmm. have been going down while our spending has exploded. Mm -hmm. So about a trillion dollars a year uh, is spent on marketing in this country every year. And, and yet 85 to 88 percent of customers have a negative view of marketing customer loyalty and, lo and trust are down, as I said, and the effectiveness of a lot of marketing tactics is very low. So what are the returns to customers, to companies, to society for all of that money, which is huge, is equal to the GDP of India, what we spend on marketing here. And so I did a lot of work on marketing productivity and the problems with that, and then um, started a project around 2004, trying to identify how we can do marketing right. So the project was called In Search of Marketing Excellence. Mm. And we wanted to identify companies that spent much less than the industry mm. average on marketing and yet had much higher levels of customer loyalty and trust because uh, the norm is the other way around. And with that lens, we found a bunch of companies that actually spent 90% below the market, 80% below, mm. you know, Whole Foods mm. as a good example, Starbucks, Google, Jordan's Furniture, locally here and yet have outstanding customer loyalty and trust. And we started to dig into these companies and understand what they were doing. And we discovered that there was a broader story there. It wasn't just about marketing or customers. The employees were equally loyal and trusting. Their suppliers had long, stable, mm -hmm. mutually beneficial relationships with them. Uh, they were deeply embedded in their communities. They, beyond all of that, however, so they were stakeholder oriented, not just customer focused. And secondly, that they had a reason for being as a business that went beyond the normal explanation which we assume is the only reason anybody gets into business is to make money. Actually, as it turns out, great businesses exist for a reason and there's a higher purpose as we call it. So all of these businesses have almost a missionary zeal about them. There's something that they're trying to change. You know, they're not just trying to be another airline, another grocery store, another furniture store. So there's a higher purpose, stakeholder orientation. We discovered the leaders were quite different. They were much, uh, motivated by the purpose and by service to people. And they weren't driven by power or personal uh, enrichment uh, nearly as much as uh, most leaders are. And finally, we found the cultures of these companies were quite different, uh, based upon a lot of trust and authenticity and transparency, but most importantly, this idea of love and care. Uh, there's really an authentic feeling of caring there for the people who work in these enterprises, but also for all the lives that they touch. So we discovered a pattern of being that, so that project evolved from search of uh, market, in search of marketing excellence. We started calling it Share of Heart. Uh, but eventually we published that book under the title of Firms of Endearment, uh, how world-class companies profit from passion and purpose. And, and the, the bottom line of all of that, you know, having identified this particular way of being, we went out and looked for other companies that seemed to fit that mold. 28 of them, and then at the end of that, we did the financial analysis. And our expectations were quite modest. So we, for the public companies, we said, okay, if, if they deliver returns to investors that are about on par with everybody else, we can still say that these businesses are creating a lot more value because of what they're doing for their the lives of employees and the uh, lives and well-being of customers and communities, et cetera. So we were prepared to make that a holistic argument. What we found was actually these companies outperformed uh, in the stock market by about nine to one over a 10 year period. So they were dramatically more successful financially even as they were creating many other kinds of wealth. You know, emotional well-being of people, the spiritual well-being, sense of meaning and purpose, but the impact on their health, on the environment, on, on communities, et cetera, all positive. So this was a, a very powerful uh, way of organizing and thinking about but before we, I know you're about to launch into conscious capitalism. Yes. <laughs> Let me just go back for a second. Can you kind of trace the history of capitalism? Sure. So capitalism, as we, as we understand it now, um, 
the idea essentially based upon freedom, that individual human beings are free to decide what they focus on, to create value in the way in which they are called to or they are skilled to do, and then be free to exchange and trade value with each other. That if we create the condition, this was I think Adam Smith's great insight, was that if you create the conditions in which people are, uh, are able to fulfill those natural inclinations that they have, and we don't, not only do we not put impediments to that, but we actually create conditions that enable that to happen in a better way, that that will then result in greater prosperity for all, as well as the meeting of needs that, that exist. So you don't have to have a central planning authority that figures out what needs to be made and how much and what price and all of that. And why is it getting so much criticism these days? Well, I think uh, what happened was that capitalism, if you look at the or origin, 1776 is when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, mm -hmm. same year that the United States mm -hmm. became a country and, and a society predicated on the idea of freedom, right? And then these ideas that Adam Smith had come up with at the same time, I think all of those things came together in this society in a more very powerful way. And you've seen in the last two centuries, starting here and in Europe and then spreading, uh, especially the last few decades now, all over Asia and other places, you've seen the tremendous power that capitalism has had. So after thousands of years of per capita incomes worldwide uh, being below $500, in the last 200 years, we have gone up to close to now $10,000 on a global basis. So a 15-fold increase at least in 200 years after flatline for thousands of years. And we've seen dramatic impacts on life expectancy from 28 to 70. We've seen literacy go from 10% to 90%. We've seen our human population rise from a billion to seven billion in that time period. So a lot more people living longer, more fulfilled and more human lives okay. as a consequence of the widespread embrace of, of this institution of free market capitalism. I mean, in that context. Yeah. Now, what is conscious capitalism? So again, the criticism, why, you know, why oh, has yeah, it yeah. Become, uh, become a sort of controversial thing? You know, capitalism has achieved all of this, but it has done it with a mindset which, which over time got a little bit hardwired into the minds of even business leaders, is that the only purpose of business is to maximize profit. And so we've taken this extraordinary field of human activity and we've reduced it almost to a machine and almost to a math problem. Right? It's a machine that you put inputs and you get outputs, products and profits and so forth, and that it's something that you manage in order to maximize this one thing, maximize profit subject to everything else. And the fact is that it is an interconnected, interdependent system. And in any system like that, when you try to maximize any one thing, you actually harm the whole. Because you have to look at the optimal health and well-being of the whole, because it's all interconnected, interdependent components to that. So this narrative about business, that it is about profit maximization, shareholder value maximization, et cetera, was foisted on capitalism or business by economists and in a sense by critics. Karl Marx and others came along and took that narrative and said, yeah, if this is what this institution is all about, it is inherently going to exploit because anytime there's a trade-off to be made between somebody's health and well-being and my profit maximization, well, that's what I'm supposed to do. And you know, economists and others started to convince us that you could get sued for not doing that. It's not true. You know, in the in legal sense, a corporation exists. It's its own thing. You don't exist. You don't, as a leader of a corporation, you don't work for the shareholders. You work for the corporation. And your duty is to the well-being of that entity. And that includes the flourishing of all of the elements that are within that. So with that narrow identity, we started to do a lot of things and we use language around profit maximization, et cetera, that really caused a lot of alienation. Certainly caused us to use people you know, as means to that end. You know? And so a lot of working conditions, et cetera, not, uh, not very conducive to our mm -hmm. development. And certainly suppliers were squeezed, uh, costs were externalized onto society. And so we have all the negative consequences now. Mm -hmm. So if you look at you know, the impact certainly on the environment that we've had, the impact on, on the, you know, the health of people, the impact on many other species that are on this planet, all of those have been sacrificed in a way at this altar of profit maximization. And the great tragedy is none of that needs to happen. You can achieve extraordinary profits while creating positive impacts in all those areas as well. And that's where this consciousness now is, is coming to us, this realization that there is a better way and that when you align all these forces together, you know, you create so much more value. Business is ultimately value creation 
you know, it's a system for extraordinary mm -hmm. value creation. Mm -hmm. so it's the most amazing mm -hmm. system we've ever invented for that. So now with higher consciousness, with people looking for more out of life, with people now concerned about the consequences of their actions, with people thinking about their legacies, you know, with people at a stage in life now where more people are in midlife and beyond with the aging of the population, where meaning and purpose mm. become central mm. questions. All of those factors are coming together now to, to put pressure on businesses to also think differently about their purpose mm. and their role in the world. You talk about four tenets or four principles. Would you talk a little? Yeah, so these were kind of inductively uh, discovered by us through the process of writing firms of endearment mm. and and they are higher purpose. Every mm. business must have mm. a higher purpose, a reason for existing that goes beyond making money. You have to make money in order to survive as a business. Mm. Well, that's almost a given. It's like saying I need red blood cells in order mm. to live. It doesn't mean that I dedicate my life to producing red blood cells. Mm. Right? Profits are great, profits are essential, but that cannot be your purpose. So there has to be a higher purpose, a reason why you exist. Secondly, you have to think about all of the stakeholders as inherently uh, integral to the enterprise and creating value for all of them as part of your purpose. So it's not just about creating value for investors and therefore we need to have products for customers and so forth. It's saying how do we create uh, working conditions for people where they feel fulfilled, they have a sense of meaning and purpose, they can express their individuality, how do we have suppliers. So all stakeholders need to be thought about in terms of value creation for them and you know integrating their interests together so we don't trade off. We think about how do we get win-win outcomes mm -hmm. across them. And the third is conscious leadership. The leaders, you know, we can find leaders who are motivated primarily by power. We can find leaders who care only about money, but those are not the leaders you want. The truly inspirational, transformative, uh, effective leaders are those that are passionate about the purpose and they're passionate about mm -hmm. service to people. They're servant leaders, but they have a tremendous capacity for love and care for people. Mm -hmm. And of course, they also have high levels of emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence, and they have a systems mind. They can see the whole. And lastly, the culture. So the conscious culture, which includes some of the elements I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. Those are the four tenets as we have identified mm -hmm. of this way of being. Is this business. measurable? It is measurable mm -hmm. up to a point. Of course, not everything that matters in, 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 in life mm -hmm. can be measured. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so this whole adage that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, I think is just false because it, it, it it's again a mechanistic view, you know. It's, I mean, we're living organisms, right? How do how do how would you say companies in general are doing? Has there been any change? Um, and how would you figure that out? Um, I do think that you know, in the last uh, six seven years that we've been doing this, and we're not alone. I mean, there are many other uh, voices out there that are calling for mm -hmm. these kinds of changes using perhaps a different language. But there, there is a shift going on in the world of business. Mm. We can definitely see it. The fact is the world has changed a lot. You know, the realities are out there. You know, we didn't have the internet, 20, World Wide Web 25 years ago. Mm. You know, we didn't have the same demographic forces. We didn't have the same level of connectivity and all the rest. So the world has fundamentally changed. And business leaders are seeing that the old way doesn't work anymore. You know, we have this operating system for business that was really created well over 100 years ago based upon the military as the organizing metaphor and in the context of the industrial age. Mm -hmm. right? And the world is very different from that today. Mm -hmm. So people are recognizing that the old way doesn't work and you see more and more companies that are starting to discover that purpose matters mm -hmm. and they're starting to think about what is their purpose. They're starting to recognize that value creation for all stakeholders mm -hmm. is interdependent and therefore you can't just treat some as a means, others as an end. Mm -hmm. So I would say overall there are quite a few companies that are moving in this direction. There are many new companies that are born with this, mm -hmm. you know, implicit in their DNA. But even existing uh, large companies are gradually making the shift, quite a few of them. I'm personally aware of and working mm -hmm. with some of them, actually. You, you, you talk in the book about a number of them. Could you just pick any one and kind of tell us what makes this a good example of conscious capitalism? Well, probably the best one is Whole Foods Market, okay. which I wrote the book with the CEO okay. and the founder of Whole Foods, John Mackey. And in many ways, Whole Foods exemplifies these four pillars better than most companies. So they, of course, started with a higher purpose in 1978. The name originally of the company was Safer Way. It's a play on safe way, right? Hmm. Saying that's actually not safe. So they had a passionate belief that what you put into your body makes a difference to your health and the health of the food system and the health of the planet as a whole. And that's informed everything that they've ever done, that higher purpose, that educating people about that and giving them 
access to better quality foods and thereby enhancing their, uh, the quality of their lives and their longevity and, and so forth. So that remains for them as critical and as vital a purpose. In fact, even more so perhaps today with the rising levels of obesity and diabetes and incidence of cancer and everything else and our exploding healthcare costs. You know, in 1960, we spent 5.7% of GDP on healthcare and about 16% on food. Today, we're close to 20% on healthcare and down to 8% on food. Yeah, so there's a connection between those two trend lines. It matters what you put into your body. So that's their purpose. Second thing, they have an explicit document uh, on their uh, website called the Declaration of Interdependence, recognizing that all of their stakeholders, the suppliers, the farmers, the customers, employees, cust uh, communities, investors, we're all part of this interconnected interdependent system and we recognize the interdependence that we have. Right? And therefore, we need to manage our enterprise in a way that simultaneously looks at the impacts on all and tries to create positive impacts for all over time. Everybody can and should win in the context of how we do business. The third is the idea of leadership. I mean, Whole Foods, just as a, as a tangible example of that, has voluntarily adopted a salary cap where the highest pay in the company cannot exceed 19 times the average pay. Now, just for comparison, that ratio at a typical public company has ranged from about 270 to 500 over the last five years. Mm -hmm. right? So they're at you know, 10 times less in terms of compensation for the people at the top, but the people in the rank and file, or ordinary employees or average employees make a lot more, but the people at the top are relatively modestly paid. And they believe that's because you know, there's a notion of internal equity as opposed to just looking at what other people are paying their leaders. And that we want leaders who actually care about things other than just money. You know, because if you use only money as an attractor, you get people who care only about money. And the business is secondary. And they look at it as numbers. And they say, well, I can run an airline, I can run a supermarket, I can run anything. Just show me the numbers. I know how to manage the numbers. It dehumanizes. So they want people with a real passion for, for the business. And the last thing is their culture, very much embodies all of these elements, trust and authenticity and transparency. Every salary in Whole Foods is known to everybody else. That's an extreme level of transparency, right? And there's no hardly any secrets on anything. Uh, and of course, the love and care. The idea, you know, when they started, they said, can you build a business on love and care? Most businesses have a huge amount of fear and stress in them. You know, we use carrots and sticks as motivators, right? And that's basically operating out of fear and stress. Mm -hmm. And people are not effective, people are not happy mm -hmm. when they are operating in that way. Mm -hmm. They cannot be creative, they cannot be inspired, they cannot feel any joy in that setting. But what would be care? kind of your optimistic view of the future? Of <laughs> you know, it's, it's really uh, sh shifting, it's kind of flipping the narrative about business. You know, right now, so just to go back to food, Normal food is processed and you know, full of artificial ingredients and so forth, and, and organic is kind of this niche, mm. right, or natural, mm. real food. In that realm, you know, the hope is that one day we can flip that so that normal food becomes natural and mm. good and all that, and then you have a small niche which is other stuff. Likewise, in the realm of business, right now what we talk about is kind of a niche idea. There are some companies that are out there talking this way, but the mainstream, certainly public companies, anybody subject to Wall Street's scrutiny and analysis very much toes the line of quarterly you know, profits and profit maximization as, mm -hmm. as the mantra. Our dream and hope is that one day that gets flipped, that the, this becomes a default way of being, that it becomes conventional wisdom that you know, people say, well, of course a business has to have a purpose other than profit. I mean, that's you know, kind of silly not to, <laughs> you know, to argue that. Of course, we must create value for all stakeholders. Of course, we need leaders who care about what we're doing and, and the impact it has on the lives of people and not just about the shareholders, et cetera. I mean, it seems, you know, that, 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 and that I think, uh, you know, will happen, I think, in the next few decades. Mm -hmm. I think we will shift the conventional wisdom will become now what we are talking about. Well, it's the most sensible idea and important concept. I mean, I, I recommend anybody read this book, Cap Conscious Capitalism. Uh, we're about out of time. I'd like to thank our guest, Raj Sisodia, for Business Insight. I'm Peter Marks. Thanks for joining us.